Good morning. I got kicked by a horse. I don't know if you guys have ever had horse steaks before, but they're really not that bad. <laughs> um, you know, I've raised this stupid thing since it was a baby, and I don't understand what the heck happened, but um, the Lord obviously didn't want me to go to the Dominican Republic, so here I am this morning, or my family for that matter. So um, it's great to be in the house of the Lord with you. I've had a great nurse. My wife has been beyond phenomenal. This isn't the first time she's ever taken care of me. Um, I was in a head-on collision back in 2014. I was in the hospital for 30 days. Both my feet were shattered and my insides were all scrambled and uh, literally she nursed me back to health. So this isn't the first time I've preached in a wheelchair either because I was in a wheelchair for uh, quite a few months after that car wreck. And um, so I'm used to it. But last time I almost drove off the stage because it was an electric one and it stuck. And I mean, I'm like trying to grab the wheels of this 3,000 pound thing. Finally, I get the thing uh, off going forward. And literally I was teetering. And the, the people in the front row ran and were like trying to get ready to catch me. So, so this time if I fall off, it'll be my own fault, right? So if you turn with me to Acts chapter one, uh, chapter two, excuse me, this morning. Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at Peter's sermon this morning. Peter's sermon is a powerful uh, sermon, and the thing I love about Peter, this is probably the greatest, or I would say this is the best sermon ever preached, Uh, and as we dissect it and unpack it, we look at it and we notice some things, amazing things here from Peter's heart, and we see his focal point. His focal point is always Jesus, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Peter's going to unpack the sermon and we're going to take it in two parts, part one this week, part two next week. Uh, But he's always speaking about the death, burial, the resurrection, and interestingly enough, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He wants us all to know Jesus. And he also wants us all to know that Jesus is coming again to get his people With all the calamity, with all the craziness in the world, Jesus is coming back and he's going to set things right. That's who he is. And so the center of our lives and the center of our preaching should always, and I mean always, be Jesus. So Peter, empowered with the Holy Spirit, just like the promise in Acts chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit would come upon them, it has happened The Holy Spirit has come upon Peter. Peter, the one that denied Christ three times. Peter that whacked off the servant's ear. Peter that could not stay awake when he preached, when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, now is a new man. Completely and totally different than he was before. Filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is radiating out of Peter's life. Guys, let me tell you, once you're touched by the Holy Spirit of the living God, you will never be the same. And we see that in Peter's life. Peter will never be the same. He will be a man after God's own heart, a man that is standing bold and courageous, preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And this is what we will see from Peter's life as we go through this sermon over the next couple of weeks. So with that, will you join me? And I'm going to back up a little bit. I know that James touched on this slightly, but I want to begin in verse 11. It said, Cretan is Arabs. We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God. So there's something supernatural that is happening right now. It has fallen upon God's people, the 120 in the upper room. The Holy Spirit has come upon them, and now they're hearing them speak in over 15 different languages. They hear the wind rustling. They they see the fire fall down upon the apostles and upon the people. And all of a sudden, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're declaring the magnificent works of God. And then we see in verse 12, they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what? Does this mean? Underline that. Circle it in your Bibles. But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. And Peter stood up. He's going to address the mockery, right? 
with the eleven, raised his voice and proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all the residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. What a different guy. Listen up. Listen up. You guys need to hear what I'm about ready to say. Pay attention. I'm no longer going to cower before a slave girl. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I have courage and boldness. And now I'm going to speak truth. Let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only nine in the morning. By the way, there's no way they could have possibly been drunk. And how they figure that out at nine in the morning or the third hour is from sunrise three hours later. They, they count sunrise as the beginning of the time, usually 6 a.m. So it's around nine in the morning. And the interesting thing, dur during feast week or feast day, they would have never, ever even eaten until noon. So he's saying, you guys are a bunch of fools. We're not drunk. This is the supernatural act of God that you are witnessing right now. We're not drunk. And so he, he addresses the mockers first. For these people are not drunk as you suppose since it's only nine in the morning or the third hour. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel and, in, and it will be in the last days, says God. Notice that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. In verse 21, and then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is truth. Thank you that you want us to understand, you want us to see the power of people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are walking in the Holy Spirit, that are surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would speak through me to touch each person's heart in here in a powerful, powerful way. That your Holy Spirit would permeate this building, permeate our lives, and that you would be glorified. King of kings, Lord of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we have, we have Peter. Remember 50 days before, fell asleep, he he ridiculed, he mocked, and now he's full of boldness. And guys, this is a beautiful picture of a supernatural life filled with the Holy Spirit. If you think there's something missing in your walk with Jesus Christ right now, I would be willing to say that you are missing or grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when the Holy Spirit begins to live in you and through you, when you are anointed by the Holy Spirit, your life will be different. Your life will change. Your life will be like Peter's. The spirit changes things. Everybody say that. The spirit changes things. Now, what, is, what does he do here? First, he addresses the mockers, the scorners. Anytime I've noticed when there's a great work of God or even a great work of people in the body of Christ, when God is moving and God is doing something, Satan rears his ugly head and attacks. And he sends mockers and scorners. Yet, interestingly enough, what Satan meant for evil, even amongst Christian brothers, he sends mockers and scorners and sneers. What Satan meant for evil, God used for good. What did it do? It turned out to be, okay, you're going to mock. Let's address this. What does this mean? Let's address this situation. And let me tell you what's really going on here. And boom, a great sermon is preached, right? But it's interesting to me that when God begins to do a mighty work in a people or a nation or an individual, collectively or individually, the mockers come. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I see it all the time, right? Here's what I know. Here's what I know. If you do not want to have a significant impact for the kingdom and the glory of God, 
and you do not want to have a significant impact on your family and your marriage and people in your life and your nation and your communities, then say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. And if words were not dangerous, Satan would not be trying to silence us all the time, amen? But he knows the truth will set you free. He knows that we, when we speak truth, whether it's in this political climate or whether it's in, it, it, when you're sharing the gospel or community or you're, you're sharing the love of Jesus Christ with people, Satan knows that your words mean something and that they can change a life. The gospel changes things. As a matter of fact, when you speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God is unleashed. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Do you realize that every time you share, whether it's your testimony or God's love or anything with other people or the truth with other people, the power of God is unleashed through your life into other people. And this is the truth. This is the honest truth about what God can do in a life. And he, we see it in Peter's life as he stands up here right now and he begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and he begins to lay it out and say, look, this is the feast day. No one would even be eating or drinking till noon. You guys are a bunch of knuckleheads. And Satan mounts his attack. And if your voice held no power, they wouldn't try to silence you. And here it is. And then now we get to verse 17. Now Paul, Peter, excuse me, answers the honest question. He's going to answer the honest question. And guess what? What's he going to use when he answers the honest question? I want to hear it from you people. What's he going to use? The word of God. The word of God. So they're going to ask, what does this mean? And he's not going to give his own opinions. He's not going to give his own experience. He's not going to give his own thoughts. He's going to give a biblical, scriptural example of the supernatural. He's saying, look, what you guys are experiencing today is supernatural. It's beyond yourself. It's something that God is doing. And I'm going to testify of it from the word of God. Because God always balances us out and our own thoughts, our own opinions, our own experience, he always balances it out with the word of God. And let me tell you something, anytime we see the supernatural, ladies and gentlemen, John 15, 26 says this, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify about your experience. Oh, I'm sorry. He will testify, uh, testify about your own thoughts, your own opinions. No, what does it say? He will testify about me, Jesus Christ and him crucified. You will, all, he will, you will all also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. L listen, when you see a supernatural act of God, there's two things that you need to realize. Number one is the supernatural act of God must always be backed up with Scripture. Show me chapter and verse. It's okay to ask the question, where do you find that in the Bible? What does this mean? It's okay to say, look, I'm not seeing this in the Bible. I am not seeing this in the Bible. So I'm, I'm going to question whether it's a really, a truly a supernatural act of God or your own experience, your own thoughts, your own opinions. And so that's what I love about Peter. Peter takes them to the word of God to answer the question. And guys, it's okay to answer the question, what does this mean? What am I seeing here? Do I see this in the scriptures? Is this supernatural act that I'm witnessing right now, is it from God? Because if it's from God, I guarantee you, you will always be able to find it right here. And that's what I love about James Gordon. I'll say something. When we're having a conversation, he'll say, what's the word? I'll say it just like, what's the word? Jay, what's the word? What he says to me. And I back it up with scripture. And I love that about that man. The man of the word. Because if you stay close to the word of God, you will never, ever wander from the truth. And be based out of your experience. Because even the Holy Spirit himself, he says this very clearly. The Holy Spirit points to one thing, always and forever and continually, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified and him resurrected. Amen? 
And so here we have, don't miss the power and abundant life, guys. Here we have some things going on here. And I like to ask the question, does what I'm seeing or hearing match up with Scripture? And where can I find the supernatural act in the Bible in its context? Because what? I say this all the time. A text without a context is a what? Pretext, right? Has to be in the context of the Scriptures. Now, there's two dangers that can happen here regarding the supernatural. We can reje reject the supernatural altogether. Completely and totally deny that there are gifts of the Spirit, that God has a gift for each one of his body of a believer, that God still heals, that God still does miraculous, that God still does all kinds of things in our life. We can deny the supernatural act and power of God. I feel so sorry for people like that. They're, they're missing out on the abundant life. God wants to dump his spirit upon your life and give you gifts and power and abundant life and resources beyond your own recognition, beyond your own, own natural gifts and talents. And so there's that danger. There's the danger to deny the power and the working and the supernatural of the living God and the gifts of the spirit. I feel sorry for those kinds of Christians. Boring. I mean, holy smokes, right? Yawn. Ugh. I want to see God work powerfully in my life. I want to see him do miracles through my life. Anybody else? Or am I alone in here? But there's another danger to abuse. To abuse it. We have to be careful of both. The other danger Denying the supernatural. The other danger, of course, is to believe everything that seems supernatural is from God. We need to open, uh, to be open of the working of God, but we have to be careful. Not every su supernatural work in the world is from God. Satan is fully capable of doing supernatural works. Let me explain. Let me, let me clarify with some scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says concerning the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 24, false Christ, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we have to be careful, right? I mean, I mean, these guys are devout men. They've been studying the word of God and and. So what does Peter do, right? Peter takes them to Joel. He takes them to the word of God. And I think it's okay for us as Christians and especially leaders to be able to say, was this spoken by Jesus here and where was it said, right? Was this spoken in the book of Acts? Where was it spoken of in the book of Acts? Uh, do I see this in the epistles? Is this, did Jesus say it or do it in the gospels? It always, does it always point to Jesus? We can always ask those questions. Matter of fact, here I'll give you five questions that you can ask and they'll be on the screen. Here's a great way to test to see if it's from God or not. Do I find this in the gospels? Number one. Did Jesus teach it? Number two. Was it practiced in the book of Acts? Number three. Or I'm going to give you four, not five. And was there an illustration concerning it in the epistles? Listen, we got to be careful that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes in. And I've seen this too many times in the body of Christ. You know, every new fad comes through, blows through, and all the Christians grab a hold of it. And they think it's the new, you know, secret to the, to the spiritual life, right? They think it's a, it's a new secret. Don't panic, honey. I'm not going to go off. See? Told you. And they think this new secret, you know, and, and what happens is, is we grab a hold and we latch onto these movements, these things that, that people consider a work of God. And what happens is, is five years go by, seven years go by, 20 years go by, and people don't grow and they never surpass where they've been in the beginning. Like there's not enough about the death, the burial, the resurrection, the power, the, the, the mercy, the grace, the love of God, the unsearchable riches of Christ in this book. You will never experience, you will never learn it all this side of heaven. You don't need a new fad, a new experience. One of the things that drives me nuts is when people say, and, I, and believe me, I believe Christians can be oppressed, and I believe Christians can open up the door. You, you've been delivered from pornography, drugs, alcohol, and you grab it again, it'll come back seven times harder than it did before, trust me. 
So I'm not saying that Christians cannot be oppressed, but I mean, I hear all the time that, oh, you know, we got to cast the demon out of this Christian. Where's that in the epistles? Where's that in the book of Acts? Where's that in the gospels? Jesus is not going to share a condo with Satan of your heart and your life. Now, can you be oppressed? Oh, Satan can sink his claws deep in your mind and he can whisper in your ear and you can give in to him and he can lead you and guide you. And you can quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not get me wrong. But things like that, that people throw out there. Show me, chapter and verse, guys. I want to see where there's a Christian that's demon possessed in this Bible right here. Jesus wants you to be healthy and rich. But Paul told Timothy to have a little wine with his stomach because he couldn't cure his stomach, yet. Paul raised people from the dead. Paul asked Jesus, what, three times to be healed probably of an eye, blindness, eye ailment, and what, did, what happened there? Sorry, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Suck it up, buttercup. Yet this man could raise the dead. He wants you to be rich. Tell that to somebody in the Sudan right now who doesn't even have a meal to eat whose family's been murdered and raped and pillaged. Now, does God want you to have inner peace and joy and contentment and understand his mercy and his grace and his great love for you and the unsearchable riches of Christ that you've been adopted, predestined, given an inheritance, given spiritual gifts beyond your wildest dreams, been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and been anointed with the Holy Spirit? We'll get into that in later on in the book of Acts because I have something to talk about as far as the second blessing that goes if, but you just have to stick it out with me especially you cessationists that'll be fun you can put it in your theological pipe and smoke it and come up with your own theology on it but I can't wait till we get there but that's for I could preach on that for 40 minutes so I'm not going to go there anyways here's what I just want to caution us with people there is so much in this word to learn about Jesus and, and, and I mean, I, I, look at the, I look at the scriptures and I just say, look, what did Peter do? Peter takes them to the scriptures. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants to bless them and show them what God is really like. And he stands up and he begins to preach the word of God. And he begins to lay out for them the scriptures. And the problem with all these movements is, is they allow people to mock. They allow the outside unbelievers to mock and sneer and make Christianity a joke. So I, I personally don't want to give them that opportunity, amen? Speak the truth with love. And so that brings me to the next point here that we have. And here, two different things are going on here. We have two different scenarios from the prophecy of Joel. We have a dark side. And we have a bright side. And so Peter, and, and guys, here's the thing, right? Everybody's like, oh, Garrett, why do you, you know, God's not negative. Listen, the gospel is negative. There is a hell, there is a judgment, and there are sins that you need to be saved for. Otherwise, why in, in God's green earth would the, would, the, would the news be good? Why would it be good news? If, you, if you're not saved from something, if you're not saved from everlasting torment and hell and judgment and the wrath of God, then why would there be a good news that you can be saved from that? That you can experience the abundant life and eternal life. And so what Peter does here, he says, look, I got some good news and I got some bad news. And with the bad news is always the good news because the good news is always greater than the bad news. And so for the first part, in verses 17 and 18, he says, look, I will pour my spirit out upon my people. I'm going to bless my people. I'm going to give you of myself, the Holy Spirit upon you and in you. And alongside you, there's three manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes epi, like when Jesus was baptized, it came upon him. Here I go, I'm going in my 45-minute sermon. Parakletos comes alongside of you. And the other Greek word is in, E-N. Inside you, sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we'll unpack that in the weeks to come. And I'll hopefully help you understand 
God's manifestations of the Spirit working in you and through you and, and how uh, it can help us to uh, live the Christian life. Now, sorry, I'm not on my 100% game here today, guys, but I'm working on it. So verse 16, on the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In other words, shut up, mockers. Let me tell you what's really going on here. And it will be in the last days, God, says God, I, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And I will pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. This is the good news, guys. This is the great news that Peter wants to bring bear into our lives. Listen, the last days began on this day, the day of Pentecost. This is when the last days began. Almost a hundred times the Bible speaks of the last day, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the glorious day of the Lord, the coming of the wrath of God, if you will. Where God judges man, judges a Christ-rejecting world. Everybody that rejects Christ will stand before Christ. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Christ and is Lord. And this is what he's talking about. But until then, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon my people. And they're going to be filled with me. And they're going to experience power. And grace and mercy and freedom and healing and deliverance like they've never experienced before. And Numbers chapter 11 speaks about this. Matter of fact, Moses. Moses is worn out. People are complaining. He says, God, I'm done with your people. And Moses, God tells Moses, look, I'm going to take what spirit I've poured out upon you, Moses, and I'm going to put it on 70 elders. See, the spirit was poured out on occasional king, occasional prophet, occasional, uh, occasional um, servant of the Lord. The spirit would be poured out on, and they would prophesy, and they would do magnificent works of God. Some people like Elijah send, tended to have it, and Elijah tended to have the spirit upon them the whole time. Okay? So, but this wasn't for everybody. This wasn't for the common folk, the poor, the, the, the Jew, the, the Greek wasn't for them. And so when they complained to Moses, Moses, God said, Moses, listen, I'm going to take some of my spirit and I'm going to give it to 70 elders in the camp. And what happens? They bring them there. They begin to praise God and they begin to prophesy. A young man comes running from the camp and tells, tells Joseph and Moses, there's Mildad and, 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 and Mildad and Eldad are in the camp and they're prophesying. Make them stop. Joshua gets mad and says, Moses, go make them stop. And what does Moses say? And I wish that all God's people would have the spirit of the living God. I wish that all God's people would prophesy. I wish all God's people would have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them so that they could speak the magnificent works of God. Verse 11. And Moses says, don't be jealous for me. This is the Lord's work. And so that promise that Moses was speaking of there is now happening to the body of Christ. Yet I believe the church in America misses out so much. Old men, when's the last time you've had a dream from the Lord? Young women, when's the last time you've had a vision from the Lord? When's the last time that you've received a prophecy? I don't know if this is a prophecy or not. But I was walking out to feed the horses that day, and the Holy Spirit told me, you're going to get hurt out there. And I thought to myself, I have this new bull. He's 18 months old, and he's been acting like a, like a Labrador puppy. And I'm not sure if it's aggro, if he's just feeling his oats, right? But he's jumping and just ah, getting all like, I had to sock him in the head the other day. So when I walked in there, I had my eye on that bull, not the horse. Call that a word of knowledge? Would you call that a prophecy? Would you call that God just speaking to you? But he warned me and told me what was going to happen. When's the last time that God has spoken to you in such a powerful way, either through his word or through his spirit or through prayer waiting? I bet collectively in this room, 
We've probably had 100 hours of waiting on the Lord in prayer this week. Get the 120 that were in that upper room. 20 hours, days, praying, seeking, waiting on the Lord to pour out his spirit and power upon them. Listen, guys, this is the most significant thing that can happen in your life. And it marked the final chapter here, these prophecies, these dreams and visions that God doesn't, you know, it's 2,000 years, I get it. And one day for the Lord is like 1,000 years, right? But listen to this statement. I want to unpack this real quick. I will pour out my spirit. Let's break that sentence down. Number one, I, the sovereignty of God, the great I am, the preexistent one. The one that spoke to Moses in the burning bush, I am that I am. Jesus says, I am. Tell him that I am sent you. Jesus claimed, I am the door, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I am that I am. The sovereignty of God will. The determination and purpose of God, I will. When God determines something, he will do it. The only thing that's keeping you from experiencing this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life is you. Is you. Quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. Sin. Not waiting upon the Lord. Not being in your, your words, seeking his face. God, show me who you are. I, wanna, I want you to reveal yourself to me. Listen, you know this word, you will never be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You'll scratch your head and go, where's that in the Bible? What does this mean? Like James Gordon, the word, G, the word. I know what he means now. Number three, pour out. The gracious generosity of God. He graciously wants to pour out his generous spirit. He wants to overflow you with himself. Guys, when we look at next week, we'll look at the presence of God because in his fullness is presence of joy. And we'll unpack that next week. And David said that, listen, you want to experience abundant life? You want to experience his joy and his power and his might and his goodness? I will pour out my spirit. The Trinitarian Godhead, personality of God. God himself, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the throne of God lives inside of you. Resurrection power. Everybody say resurrection power. Do you feel resurrected this morning? Do you feel the power of God living in you and through you? He wants to pour himself out into your life, upon your life. He wants to come alongside of your life, and he wants to live you in power and might. He wants to overcome your selfishness, your self-will, and your sin. And he wants to live in you and through you. He wants to do miracles. And it's funny, when I travel around the world, go to different countries, and I see miracles, and I scratch my head, and I think, why aren't we seeing that in America? We're consumed. We're consumed with our own ways, our own truth, and our own life. Jesus says, I'm here, and where the sun is, there's freedom, amen? Amen. Jesus Christ he wants to set you free. The Lord just laid a scripture on my heart, but I'm going to read it at the end. One of the greatest statements in the Bible is my friends. God ignites kingdom life in his people. He pours out his spirit on them, and they will never be the same again. And I pray that, and I plead with the Lord for fervent church, that he would pour his spirit out upon this church, and that we would never be the same again. And that I'd lay down Garrett's desires and wants and needs and focus on the living Christ and let him do far above all that I ask or think in and through my life. Now, that's the good news. 
Bad news. You guys ready? Verse 19. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Listen, this great and glorious day of the Lord, for those of you that are Christ following Christ believers this morning, it's going to be the most blessed thing that you've ever experienced in your life. But for, for those that are outside of Christ, it's going to be horror. And you're going to run into the caves and you're going to beg the caves to fall on you and hide you from the wrath of the Lamb. The good news wouldn't be so good if the bad news wasn't so bad. And, and here we, we, we have this culminating, these cat cataclysmic events where people, even though, though, here's the cool thing. During, this is encouraging to me. During the distress and the destruction, the terrorism, natural disasters, the crazy stuff we see going on in the world, the globalization, communism, false religion, moral decay, God still says in those last days, I will pour out my spirit upon you. You will dream dreams, old men, young people. You will see visions and, and, and everybody will prophesy. And not for our own glory, not to get our own platform, not to get a $50 million Gulfstream jet, but to point to Jesus, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when Jesus comes back, guys, the world will be racked with war and famine and pestilence and disease and horror on a scale unprecedented in human history. It'll make... World, Civil War, World War I, World War II look like a walk in the park. It says bodies will be so thick in the Middle East that it'll go up to horses' bridles. It won't be cold vid. It'll be a true plague. People will be dropping dead. Nothing we can do about it. Natural catastrophes, there will be war and bloodshed, there will be fire and devastation, blood, fire, billows of smoke, on the terrible wrath of the Lamb, who is coming back to judge the kings of the earth, the poor, the rich, everybody that has denied Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be judged. He will separate the sheep from the goats. The liars from those who speak the truth. The wicked and the evil from those who claim the name of the Lord. Those that have been made righteous by Jesus Christ and him crucified solely. Now, I'm not a date setter. But what I see what's going on in this world right now, you better be ready. You better be right with Jesus Christ. Because you get a chance on this side of the cross. When he comes back to rule and reign and judge the earth with his fierce wrath and judgment, you will not get a second chance. I'm not fear mongering, I'm reading the scriptures. And Peter says very clearly, he says, I will display Joel, quoting Joel chapter 2. I'll go to verse 18. I, I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, even when all hell breaks loose, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. But in verse 21, here's some more good news. You just take a deep breath, everybody. Whew. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's some good news, guys. Anybody that calls on the name of the Lord this morning, not only will be they be saved, but they will be filled with the Holy Spirit of promise. God will open up the heavens and pour his Holy Spirit down upon you, and you will have Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
And God will ignite kingdom passion in every heart for every single person that is sitting in this room this morning. And I don't know about you, but I want to be part of this plan. I want to be part of the team, the winning team. I don't want to be sitting on the stands, sitting in the bleachers, watching the game taking place. I want to, I want to seriously be part of the, 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 the situ, the, like I say, when people bring me problems, I go, okay, that's the problem. What's the, what's the, what's the fix, right? I want to be part of the fix. I want God to use me for his kingdom, his glory and honor. I want God to use me to lead my neighbors and my friends and my family to his beloved son, Jesus Christ, because I know that only in him is abundant life. Only in Jesus Christ can I experience the power and the presence of God flowing in me and through me. And God wants that for every single person in this room. It's not specific and special to Garrett. It's for every blood-bought saint of the Most High God sitting in this room this morning. And he laid a scripture on my heart, and I want to read it to you, because this is really, truly what Jesus has come back to do. It's in, if you want to turn there with me, it's in Isaiah chapter 61. <clears throat> and I'll close with this thought. Don't miss next week the presence of the Lord, his fullness of joy. We're going to really just camp on who Jesus is next week. As you know that in Isaiah, I mean in Luke chapter 4, Jesus stood up and they opened up the scroll and they handed it to Jesus in the synagogue. And he said, in this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is part of what the gospel is and Jesus Christ and him crucified as he pours out his spirit upon our lives. This is what the spirit looks like in a life. It looks like Jesus. Spirit of the Lord, God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. And then, of course, even Isaiah throws in, like Joel threw in, the day and the wrath of the Lord. He says this. This is the second coming right here. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of God's vengeance. I'll just throw that in there just so you guys know when I come, I'm not going to be the little baby in the manger. But then he says this. To comfort all who mourn. To provide those who mourn in Zion. To give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes or beauty from ashes. Festive oil instead of mourning. And splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called trees of righteousness. Planted by the Lord to glorify him. How many of you want that life this morning? How many of you are wondering, God, man, there's something more to life. I encourage you to look at Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. He wants to heal your broken heart. He wants you to set you free. He wants to give liberty to you that are captive, freedom to those that you are in prison to any kind of sin or despair or whatever. He wants to comfort you that are mourning this morning. He wants to crown you with beauty instead of ashes. He wants to give you the oil of joy instead of mourning, splendid clothes instead of despair. He wants to plant you to become a tree of righteousness so that you will be glorifying to the Lord. Amen? Can I pray for you? God, thank you for these beautiful people that you brought here this morning. I know there's many in here that aren't experiencing the full power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I know there's many in here, Lord, they do not know how to access the power of your Holy Spirit. But your word does say very clearly, Lord, we have not because we ask not.
And so I ask, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon these beautiful people right here, right now. That you would fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. That you would come upon them for ministry as you did Jesus when he was baptized. Those that don't know you, that you would come in them, seal them with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is a guarantee of their salvation. Those that are discouraged, depressed, mourning, broken, captive, you would come alongside of them and not leave them as orphan as the Paracletos, the Helper, the Comforter. Empower your people, Lord, to live victorious lives to see miracles, to dream dreams, to have visions, and to prophesy the magnificent, wondrous works of you. In Jesus' name.